Hi, I'm Behnaz Adin Adam and I'm on the Board of Directors for Asian Art in London. In this special installment of Chat with Specialists, we'll be looking at some of the most beautiful works shown to us throughout lockdown. Asian Art in London, now in its 22nd year, has always been a supporter of inclusivity and education within the arts market and the art industry as a whole. Throughout the national lockdown, we regularly checked in with our participating galleries, dealers and auction houses to see how we can help them throughout these difficult times. The lockdown was used for many of us as a period to look at the overlooked administrative cataloging and research related tasks. In early July, we spoke to the Asian Art in London 2019 participants Molly and Wallace about their Japanese and Chinese collections. Um, hi Kerr, my name is Alex Aguilar and I'm head of the Japanese department at Woolly and Wallace in Salisbury. Um, so this is a fantastic vase. I don't know if you can really see uh, the amount of details on it. It's from the Meiji period, so um, late 19th century, and uh, it's one of a pair. And uh, it's, I don't know if you can see, but it's really wonderfully detailed. It's signed um, Inoue of Kyoto, mm -hmm. and it's um, an example of, um, of these really high quality metal works that were produced in the late uh, 19th century. It, it's really a fantastic thing, really. Um, it's a shame I have only one here to show you. Here you are, madam. Oh, and fantastic. So I, I don't know if you can see the details, but um, it's, <laughs> it shows um, quite a, a, a typical Japanese scene of people enjoying um, picnics and, um, and their cherry blossoms. And uh, it, it's, they are really wonderful um, prizes in the basket. Yeah. Um, in late, uh, in iron, silver, and gold. And it would have really taken hours and hours to an artist, to the artist, for, for, um, to produce them. Um, so this one, it's also one of a pair, um, and um, so it's it's Japanese, but uh, the mounts are European. Oh. Uh, they're probably French, actually, or Moulu mounts. Um, it's um, typically decorated in the with the Imari palettes. They're really interesting for their provenance as well because they come from the Rothschild collection. Oh. Um, so uh, so yes, there are also highlights in the upcoming sale. Hi, Kurt. I, my name's John Axford. I'm the chairman of William Wallace Auction House, which is based in Salisbury. The things you can see in this photograph, including these things behind me, all of these are from one private collection. So what I've got here, I've got uh, a brush pot here, a pair of beaker vases. There's a little lacquer cup here. I'm not going to talk about all of these. Take too long. Uh, this wonderful Wootsai vase. It's wonderful, beautiful thing. Um, I thought these are nice things to talk about because they're just so lovely. I know it's a it's a brush pot. There are plenty of brush pot brush pots around. Most of your people viewing this will know exactly what it is, but uh, it dates from the transitional period. That's the transition between the Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty. It dates from around about 1640, and it's got this lovely narrative story or painting uh, around here, and it, it works very well in the round. But it typifies uh, transitional style painting, the way it's done, the style of painting, but also very much the subject matter. We've got a chap here holding a vase which contains three halberds, or sort of spear type things, to this figure here. I don't know if you can see that all right. Mm. Um, and it's 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 very typically Chinese because it's it uses a rebus. They stand for Ping Sheng Sanji. And it's uh, it's a rebus which it indicates a wish to achieve high rank quickly, so be elevated from a low level to a high level in rapid succession. So it's about uh, wanting promotion. It's got a typical transitional unglazed base. It's in really good condition as well. A little bit later in date uh, are these, this pair of vases. So instead of being 1640, these are more like 1700. So we're into the Kangxi period. Kangxi was the emperor who reigned from what, 1662 to 1722. Um, but these also are painted with scenes. I, I don't know if you can see them there, but we've got ladies and children or, or courtiers and lovers here. And it's the story of, from the um, Romance of the Western Chamber. And these are uh, scenes painted from that. These are in terrifically good condition, which is rare. It's a shape based on a bronze shape, but there's something, uh, well, I'll let your, uh, your viewers decide what they think of this. 
but the base has a very unusual mark. Can you see that? Okay, that's really rare. <laughs> you don't get a lot of those. No, I've never seen that, um, in fact. You've never seen that before? <laughs> They're well known. I've never handled one before. I've seen them in, 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 in collections, but it's quite rare to have that mark. Very difficult to do that sideways. But um, that's the mark on the base of these vases. And that's particularly rare in country porcelain. William Wallace Auction House decided to host both physical viewing and physical sale. However, at the peak of the pandemic, many of the auction houses were not able to do so. Sotheby's Chairman of Asian Arts, Henry Howard Sneed, found himself working from home and organizing a range of online auctions, which proved to be an extremely successful business model. Between his back-to-back -back conferences, he took the time to tell us about a beautiful ceramic dish with an amazing story. Monica, very nice talking to you. Uh, my name is Henry Howard Sneed. I'm Chairman of Asian Art at Sotheby's for Europe and the Americas. Great. And um, you have an object with you to talk about today. I do indeed. Well, it's, uh, it's an object in my own collection and I show it to people, um, although it may seem a, a slightly more humble object, it's something that has taught me a great deal as I enjoy the piece and handle it and, and, and uh, own it. Sure. Um, it's a piece of Jian porcelain or Jian stoneware from the Song period in China. And I bought it as part of a, a group lot. Let me just show you the bowl here. Mm. I bought it as part of a group lot and thought it's a misfired piece of Jian, not very interesting and, uh, you know, how nice to have, but I'll put it in a box and never really get it out. You can see that on the back here, there are plenty of labels, which always indicates uh, it's nice for collectors because it suggests it has nice long provenance and history. And in fact, one of the things that began to attract me to it is the fact that it has the most beautiful patina, the most beautiful surface to it, which is a surface that can only be uh, achieved by being handled and by being looked at, kept in silk um, and treasured. So I'm starting in my mind as I look at it to think about it, why should this be? And then if you look a little more closely, and I'll bring this up to the camera to show you, mm. Here on the rim, there is a restoration. A uh, piece has been chipped out of the rim and it has been restored using lacquer. And mm -hmm. on discussing this with a Japanese uh, art colleague of mine, we recognize that this lacquer is Momoyama lacquer, so uh, probably 15th, 16th century, mm -hmm. which means that this piece was treasured in Japan as early as the 15th, 16th century. Now, given that the piece itself is probably 12th, 13th century, and given that it has been kept in silk, there's an obvious question here is, well, how come a piece of misfire gen should be so treasured? I logged that in my mind and my memory without really having an answer to it until speaking to a dealer in Taiwan who about this piece, about many things, but about this piece in, in included. And he said, oh, from your description, this must be, and he used a phrase with it, which it, it is in Chinese, but basically translates as ashes of roses. Wow. And it turns out that in the 16th century in Japan, the glaze, which is described as ashes of roses, was considered to be one of the most sought after and the most desirable. Of course, today, I show you again, mm. it's considered misfired. But at the time in Japan, in the 16th, 17th century, my understanding is that this would have been treasured, would have been very carefully looked after, and would have been beautifully restored when needing to. So the fact that this tells so much more story than one would ever have begun to think when first picking it up is the piece that endears me to it. And I have to say, it's one of my favorite pieces. Yeah, it has an amazing story, definitely. It wasn't just Sotheby's that held online sales. Bonhams and Christie's were also both utilizing the available technology to hold a variety of auctions, including two charitable auctions. Bonham's global head of Chinese works of art and ceramics, Asap Hyman, took the time to tell us about a 3,000-year-old bronze Chinese food vessel. 
Hello, uh, my name is Asaf Hyman, and I'm the global head of Chinese ceramics and works of art at Bonhams. So we have auctions uh, from as far as Sydney, London, Edinburgh, New York, Los Angeles, and Hong Kong. And uh, so I'm looking after those auctions all the time. And you've just sent me some pictures of a beautiful archaic bronze food vessel. I'm wondering if you could tell me a bit more about that, its, its original purpose, its history. Well, we're really delighted to have to have these piece. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, first of all, in terms of period, uh, we're looking at the 11th, 10th century BC. Mm. So it's about 3,000 years old uh, and dates to the early Western Zhou dynasty. And a vessel like that would have been very expensive at the time, would have been made to honor an ancestor and to offer as part of a suite of a bronze vessel uh, different types of food. This one would have been used uh, to hold probably grain but there would have been other vessels for, uh, for wine uh, and for water to look after the ancestors and the afterlife and to look after the, the well-being of, of their spirits. Uh, so it's quite special, mysterious objects and such. Uh, this particular example is really beautifully cast with a very broad, uh, what we call a tartia mask, a master mask with sea scroll shaped horns, uh, with a flange in the center serving as, as the nose, Around the foot, there are pairs of archaistic dragons. What's also special about this is its more recent history, if you like, mm. of the last 40 years. Uh, particularly with uh, archaeological material, it's important to have uh, previous history, previous provenance. Um, this one uh, goes back to the Rafi Motorheader collection in New York. Uh, and it's been sold already at auction as early as the late 1970s and it's been exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, in the early 1980s. So it's, it's just a nice, it's, it's, a, it's a great object to have. And finally, Christie's, who held an auction for their Arts of the Islamic and Indian Worlds, including Oriental Wives and Carpets, which took place on the 28th of October, had the following highlights. Hi, my name is Behnaz, and I'm the head of sale for the Islamic and Indian sales at uh, Christie's Auction House in London. I thought I would um, show you guys a couple of my favorite lots and um, highlight selections of the upcoming auction. Um, on the table here we have a collection of four tiles. They're known as Isnik tiles because of the town they were created in, which lies about 90 kilometers southeast of today's Istanbul. Um, Isnik tiles were used to decorate both interior and exterior um, of architectural elements such as schools and mosques and today uh, if you go to Turkey you can see so many of them in situ surviving in monuments from the 16th, 17th century or even earlier. Um, they are wonderful examples of Islamic art, they have so much color, they have beautiful patterns, they are dated according to the colors that were used because every few decades the uh, artists managed to figure out how to include different um, colors within the um, design program so that makes it easier for us to know when they were made um, quite precisely and even little fragments that have survived for instance this example um, these are even precious because they're still extremely beautiful but it's only a fragmentary example this was actually mounted in Europe um, in the 20th century, it belongs to Henry Jacobi collection, who was a wonderful collector of Islamic art and carpets. And um, yeah, they have many different designs and patterns. These, um, the two vases behind you, are they also his neck? Those are really uh, wonderful examples actually, Kira, because in the 20th and 19th century, um, a lot of European artists were so inspired by Islamic design, especially Islamic wear. So the patterns you see over here are typical of what you would find on earlier examples of tiles or vases and dishes, which were used in um, everyday wear, really. Um, so they are actually European, but inspired by Islamic design. Oh, amazing. Um, and you've got another painting you wanted to show us as well, right? Yes. This painting over here is... Um, from the Royal Atelier uh, under Nasr al-Din Shah Bajar and it's been attributed with the help of um, a wonderful scholar in this field called Leila Diva to the court artist known as Yahya Ghaffari. Yahya was um, the son of Sani al-Mulk 
His works are exhibited in Iran in Gulistan Palace. There are very few known examples of his work that have come up for auction, but this particular scene is beautiful because if you have a look um, at the way he's used the perspective and at the scene that he's depicted, the use of the chandeliers, this kind of European style of painting, all of this was inspired by Nasruddin Shah's visit to Europe, especially his first visit to the Versailles. And you can actually see the king right here in the corner, um, kind of taking a look at the display that they have um, arranged with all of the courtiers and attendees bowing in respect. If you look at, um, there's a print of his visit in Versailles um, in the 19th century, which has very similar um, interiors. And you can see how he was so inspired by Europeanized ways of dining. So do you know where, um, where the scene is? Yes, actually, the scholars that helped us write um, the essay on this painting managed to discover the site. It was called the Naranjastan Gardens in Golistan Palace in Tehran. Sadly, it no longer exists. It was demolished, but um, it was inspired by the Shah's visit to Europe, one of his first visits after 1873. The memoirs of one of the court's autobiographers who actually describes the exact location, the use of different trees, the, the windows, the tile works, and the fact that it had depictions of European ladies um, all throughout the walls, which you can see kind of here. It's got such details going on. The more you look, the more you see. So it was wonderful to have that depiction of the um, monument that's no longer there. And this crystal mount, uh, fountain at the bottom was a gift from Queen Victoria to the king, oh, wow. which was highly prized, and he wanted to have it as a centerpiece when guests uh, walked in. So it's, it's a wonderful discovery in many ways.